Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community and forum, and the Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from fresh farm ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, kids and cubs. How are you today? <laughs> As you can tell, I'm in a very, very, very good mood. Welcome to the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day, is Friday. Thank God I'm fly day. <laughs> January 12th, 2024, and uh, I don't care what the weather is outside, it's a wonderful day here at the Beaver Lodge. I feel a bit like Mr. Rogers, it's a wonderful day at the Beaver Lodge. <laughs> Okie dokie. Uh, for we have a very special show for you. I'm glad that you're joining us because for us, this is an event. If we can ever say we've had one. This is what I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns, he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, hey, and with me as always, as you can hear, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A uh, big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. As we said, this is a special show of a special edition of our interview project, because with us, we have hands down the biggest guests we've ever had from the world of politics indeed but before we get into it we still do the most important thing we do here every day at the beaver lodge and that's ask mr grizzly how's your mental health doing today sir you know sir um yesterday i was i was off and I was not feeling well at work. I actually came home at around 11.30 a.m. And, and worked from my couch because I was just feeling terrible physically. I don't know why. It just achy, tired. It might have been exhaustion. I came home, had a neocitron, sat on the couch, worked as much as I could. Uh, I was a little drowsy for a bit from the neocitron, but it did make me feel better. I got, my, got through the work day and then... Uh, Night came around and I'm like, I don't have the energy to do anything. So I stayed on the couch and watched Reacher, went to bed at around 9.30 and slept until 4.30. And at five o'clock, I woke up and thought, you know what? I've, I've had enough time in bed. I'm up I'm, I'm, and I'm feeling pretty good today. I so, like to hear that. Uh, mentally, I'm in great shape. Brain is back to where it should be. Physically, I'm still a little off, but not enough to restrict me from doing anything that I would normally do. So we're okay. going to have ourselves a great day, sir. Ah, oh, excellent. Uh, I'm feeling well, too. Uh, I was able to get an extension on that APAP machine because I was oh, doing the trial. Yeah, because, you know, I had been fighting with it so much mm -hmm, and the tube mm -hmm. was coming out and back. So they said, well, that's not supposed to happen, actually. So uh, they gave me another two weeks. And um, that's when I learned that I would take, I was, the reason why I was struggling with getting it on is that I was taking it off wrong. Well, that might have something to do with it then. There are Velcro straps here and those were adjusted, but apparently there were two clips in front that that's what I had to undo so that the Velcro <laughs> straps always stayed the same. I'm like... <laughs> Oh. They did not provide you with a YouTube tutorial video on how to <laughs> wear your CPAP. 
It's like a very piece of important information that I had missed. Now I'm having no trouble with it whatsoever. <laughs> That's when I go into narrator mode. When using your CPAP machine, be certain to remove the front straps, not the rear. The mm. rear must always stay in position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing I'm cute some days because, oh boy, <laughs> some days I'm not too bright. <laughs> All right. Uh, kids and cubs. Our guest today was raised in Fredericton, New Brunswick. She was elected to the New Brunswick legislature as leader of the official opposition and the liberal member for Bathurst East, East Nipisiguit, St. Isidore in 2023. She has extensive experience in both local and global business, community leadership, provincial and national advocacy, and social enterprise development. She has also spent a number of years working within government on economic policy. She's passionate about community involvement, and she's been an active volunteer and contributor to organizations like the New Brunswick Lung Association, the Joint Economic Development Initiative, Junior Achievement, Project ICT, the New Brunswick Association for Community Living, the Fredericton Homeless Shelter. Why am I here again? <laughs> I'm such an underachiever, my God. Oh, please. No, 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 no. Different fields. Um, actually, I should say Fredrickson Homeless Shelters, which is a big issue, and we'll get into that today. She has degrees in chemistry, yes. thank you, and economics from Queen's University, right here where the Beaver Lodge is. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, we like smart people. Yes, we do. And we like expertise. Remember this? Yes. Expertise is important. Yes. And she is bilingual. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. which means, as we mentioned on our show yesterday, that we will also be having a conversation in French at another time. En français. En français. Oh, oui, nos amis. Oui. And uh, she is bilingual thanks to New Brunswick's Early Immersion Program, which we will also discuss on the show, mm -hmm. paired with continued practice and a strong commitment to the French language. She and her husband have three young children. They're passionate about New Brunswick's great outdoors as avid hikers. My beaver sweetie would love that runners and campers and as we showed yesterday with that little clip she practices politics in complete sentences yes something we are very fond of here mm -hmm. adults yes. being adults yes at a time when we need adults lots of adults in the room yes kids and cubs please put your paws up and give a big round of applause for susan holt welcome to the beaver lodge Hi. Hi, how are you? Good I morning. am so excited to be here. Thank you. Oh, Thank we're you. very excited to have you. <laughs> yes. Now, kids and cubs, um, I am very excited. So my heart is actually beating a little fast. So if I speak too quickly or trip over my tongue today, you know why. <laughs> He's having a Taylor Swift moment, okay? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> oh my gosh, my daughter is going to thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, could we call you Susan? Yes, please. Okay. Um, before, when we have a guest, uh, because we asked Mr. Grizzly, how is mental health is doing today? We also ask our guests, how is your mental health doing today? Uh, my mental health is in a good place today. I'm a bit like you. I'm, I have some of the jitters of doing a podcast with mm. an audience that I'm not as familiar with. So I have that like nervous energy going on. Uh, it's Friday and it's uh, the end of a long week, I'll say. Mm. It's sort of that first week back feeling where you're mm. maybe more tired. We onboarded a critical new member of our team this week. Um, and so that's been lots of lots of energy and mm. lots of positive energy, actually. Okay. Uh, in the face of a lot of negativity in our province and in the media with yeah. the ghastly things our premier is doing with a there's a new example every day. So balancing the frustration of the direction that he's taking our province with the optimism and hope that surrounds the team that I'm building. And then you put it onto a Friday and we get together here and I've, I've got all the emotions, but mostly, mostly in good mental health. All right. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Um, let's ease into it. Uh, talking about you a bit. Um, how do we go from chemistry and economics to politics? 
I can see the economics to politics. Yes. The chemistry? Just... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a great choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in high school in an era where smart kids did science. Mm -hmm. um, and mm. particularly, they were pushing girls into STEM um, pretty hard. So if you were a smart kid, uh, then your courses were chemistry, biology, physics. That's what, that's what you did in high school. Um, and so, and look, I'm a, I'm a nerd. It suited me, right? I'm, I was raised by an accountant and a computer programmer and, you know, logic models are well baked into mm. my early childhood. My mom taught me how to program on a Commodore 64 when I was nine, right? Writing nice. basic code. You with me? Um, and I loved chemistry in high school. Like I thought the periodic table was such a beautiful structure of logic um, and enjoyed chemistry at that level and thought I had an amazing biology teacher who took us on a road trip to Montreal to go visit Merck Frost at the time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, ooh, pharmaceuticals, like maybe I'll develop a drug that saves the world. Um, so went into a biochemistry program and then first year was rough uh and second year when i was facing six hours of inorganic chemistry lab i realized this is not for me right. <laughs> <laughs> this is, there's no people in this lab there's nobody to talk to um but i had put two years two hard years into queen's chemistry and they were very generous about letting me manage my courses so that i could get a general degree in chemistry with about a three-year effort and start to switch over to a second arts degree in economics, which at the time there was an election on, my macroeconomics class felt so relevant to the conversation that was happening. Um, yeah, so, so, so chemistry was a, a poor choice. Economics was slightly better. If I had to go back now, I don't know whether I'd do commerce or psychology or philosophy or I have no idea right maybe I'll go back to school someday um but I am a bit of a a, a nerd I do love spreadsheets and data and things to be <laughs> well, well, you, you know you, <laughs> when, when you say when you say you know you might go back and do things differently now uh, it makes me think of how many you know when I was because I'm 55 I'm about nine or ten years older than you and and sorry did I give away your age there oh my god <laughs> it's quite oh, all right. God. 46. <laughs> okay. Well, sorry. Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> when I was graduating from high school, uh, it was like, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, play guitar, drink a beer. Uh, I still don't know what I want to do with the rest of my life at this age. Although that's not true. This is what I want to do, right? It just took me forever to get here. But when you're 18 years old and you're going into something that you think you want to do for the rest of your life, when you, you literally have not lived yet. At the time, I was against the idea of gap years, mm. even though I, I went straight into the workforce. I went to college years later to study what I do. But the irony being that we, we, had, a, we had a young woman on here not too long ago, 17-year-old uh, lady, who talked about mm -hmm. uh, some of the obstacles she faces in STEM. She's a polymath. Polymath? Yeah, polymath. She's like brilliant on a number of different levels. And all of our viewers and listeners were astonished at what this 17-year-old woman had to say. They're like, oh my God, I have so much hope for the future. I'm like, right, I do too. And, I'm, and, and her mother said to me, um, I would like her to take a gap year. I'm like, I think that would be a good idea. Or maybe two years. It's not, it's never too late, right? Go out, see the world, discover who you are. Because like you said, you got into chemistry so young, thinking this is what you want. And two years in, you're like, no, it's not. And I think so many young people are, are sort of funneled into the university system at such a young age. This is what you want to do with the rest of your life. Some people know, and some people do. Mm -hmm. Most don't. Yeah. Getting some noise here in the background. I'll see if I can rectify that. I'll be right back. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I had the chance to do uh, one of those convocation type speeches to my high school mm -hmm. um, back, oh, it was, feels like ages ago now, but um, probably was 20, 2015 maybe. Um, 
And that was my message to kids is like, you don't have to know what you're going to do for the rest of your life. You just have to make one choice. And if it's a bad choice, that's fine. You learn from bad choices and then you'll make another choice and then you'll make another choice. And ideally you'll get closer and closer to the best thing. Sometimes there'll be, and, and certainly in my career, there have been dead choices, you know, took the wrong job or went down mm -hmm. the wrong path, but learned from it. And so I was lucky. I was lucky that Queens was really flexible. Thank God they counted that stats class twice. So I only had to take it once and got it applied to two different, mm -hmm. two different degrees. But, you know, the sense that like, once you choose, you're locked in for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. is crippling, right? Yeah, it is. You can't, um, not in an age where all of us are going to have a dozen sort of careers and identities mm -hmm. and over our lives. So yeah, yeah we, we need more freedom to explore, I think. And yeah. And, I think yeah. that's shifting in the guidance systems and from what I see with my own kids that are in school and how they're being or how they're not being nudged, I mm -hmm. guess, in a particular direction. So hopefully yeah. it's getting better. <laughs> yeah. I was in a similar situation too when I went off to university. I went to a program that I thought was prestigious because there was only one like it all in Canada and they only accepted 50 students. And I was there for like for about a month and a half and I was like, I hate this. <laughs> I really hate this. This is not a good fit at all for me. And I, th I thought it was brilliant because it was very multidisciplinary. And I, I'm pretty much a generalist, right? Like when I graduated from communications in university, I thought, gee, if I graduated from architecture, I'd be an architect. If I graduated in like medicine, I'd be a doctor. What am I going to be a communicator? Like, where's that job? <laughs> right. And then it turns out, you know, you find out later on that there are lots of jobs, but I had this big question mark and yeah, it was, how do I put it? In my case, it was very difficult. Uh, I had asked to have my scholarship transferred to, to arts and they said, well, this is a completely different department. We can't do that. So I went home, packed out all my stuff and I, from another city and went home. And then in June, they sent me a letter saying, Hey, We've changed our minds. We'll give you the scholarship. So, well, I got into dance school now, so I'm sorry, but <laughs> which was a good fit, right? So it's uh, yeah. I I think the when we're talking about education and making a choice early, yeah, you're right, you're right, Mr. Grizzly. I would recommend for some people to take some time if they they feel they need it. But if you know, you know. Oh, it, that's right. If you know, you know, and and some people do. I have friends who work in certain industries that knew at twelve. This is what they wanted to do, pursue, and are still doing it. So, you know, hats off to you folks. Most people I know don't. Most people I know who work in their profession is not what they studied. Mm -hmm. It's not what they went to university for. Most people, and, and not that there's nothing wrong with that, but I, I really do encourage the gap year. I really do. Mm -hmm. I will say, I mean, I don't know what the, the educational path is for politics, really. Maybe it's poli sci. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know. But this I have been doing for longer, right? Like I was right. the kid who was elected class rep in junior high and did student executive and ran to, you know, get elected in my high school and in my university and in. So this piece has actually always been around. Mm -hmm. The paid work has been yeah, different and varied, mm -hmm. um, but this strange urge to engage my neighbors and represent their views and bring their voices forward in some kind of a forum that's responsible for driving change has been around since I was a kid. So, hmm. it's, so I, I'm glad you mentioned that because that actually doves, doves, doves into where I wanted to go next was where your passion from politics comes from. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it comes from two places. I think one is that is just, it's a personal, um, characteristic. I've always loved asking people questions, understanding understanding where they're at. Mm -hmm. And when people gripe, maybe is the best way to say it, you know, when people have a beef, a lot of people don't want to do anything about it or have a hard time translating their frustration into making the change. But mm -hmm. I was always the kid that was like, well, if you think that we're missing a, you know, school dance, then why don't we go about trying to make a school dance happen or if we're short on recycling options and everybody's griping about it, then, okay, well, I'm happy to, to be the person that tries to wrangle those ideas and talk to administration. And, you know, it's um, so that idea of, of listening to people, finding, you know, the, the consensus view and then actually taking the action to drive the change is... I guess a part of my personality and I don't know where, I don't know where that comes from. Um, 
just does. I think the why now maybe as mm. as because there is a difference between grade school politics and uh, and provincial mm. or professional politics. Um, there's so many pieces to it. Um, uh, if I can, I'll tell two two mm -hmm. stories. Please. One, I, I want, I've, I've long wanted the behaviors to change, I guess. I've been watching the decline in trust mm -hmm. across society for a long time now. Um, and I first decided to run in 2017, I guess. So, and then it was because I had observed and been frustrated by inauthenticity. Mm -hmm. um, and the classic rule of politics that you deliver your talking points, you deliver your talking points, strict message control. I would listen to politicians on the radio, give the same answer three times, no matter how often the interviewer was trying to get at them. And it was just deliver the party line, deliver the party mm -hmm. line. And I thought it was eroding our trust in the system. I found it exceptionally frustrating. Um, and, and so then I was one of those people complaining right? Like this needs mm -hmm. to change. This needs to change. I'm so oh, yeah, fed absolutely. up with, with this. And so then you get the people going, well, you want it to change. Make the change. Be the change. Try to do something different. Mm -hmm. So right. I did run as a candidate um, with a proposal of a, a need for a more open and transparent and sort of authentic uh, politics that's less partisan, less whipped and message controlled. Mm -hmm. um, and that didn't work out. And then I went back to the private sector and spent three years working with a social enterprise that trains and employs indigenous people into technology careers, specifically in software testing. Awesome. Yeah. Super awesome. Yeah. And I could like spend a lot of time on this show talking about Plato and the work that we did. Um, and we were doing that all across Canada. So I had the privilege of learning a lot more about relationships between indigenous communities in other places that aren't structured the same way New Brunswick is. New Brunswick has traditional treaties um, from the 1700s that govern mm -hmm. our relationship, but learning about modern treaties in you know, Saskatchewan and in the West um, was fascinating, but that's a digression. It, during that time when I was working for Plato, our premier and our attorney general got up in front of the province and held up a map and had, there was a bunch of it that was colored in red and said to New Brunswickers that they're gonna take your land. And it infuriated me mm -hmm. to a point where I just couldn't, like I couldn't sit still, right? And I, it made me go like, what's going on with the liberal leadership race, right? This, mm -hmm. this man is turning New Brunswickers against each other. It's a complete abdication of leadership. It was so angry, you know, it, it, anger was the fire that made me think what's happening in politics in New Brunswick right now. I've taken a three year hiatus, but that's unacceptable. Uh, so I looked at the liberal leadership race, didn't see candidates that represented, you know, what I wanted from my province. Um, and so that was the that was the particular nugget that got me into the leadership race with the paired continued desire to change the way that we talk to people because I'm actually really afraid that we are, our democracy is eroding this, this lack of trust, this, you know, where people just don't, don't trust politicians and thus don't trust government. And they've lost faith and faith in our public services, um, whether it's healthcare or education or our social services, where is it leading us, right? We see apathy. I look at the Ontario provincial election results and I get scared. It's the apathy, we see anarchy, right? Like it, we look at convoy stuff and I think, where is this going if we can't change our behavior as politicians and as government and rebuild trust, then mm -hmm. our democracy is gonna become really fragile. Uh, and I know that that's, I'm like talking way up here and, and but, mm -hmm. Um, but that's the nub of it for me is like, we need to have different communications that are more authentic and transparent and real that you can, you can rebuild a trust in the institution so that the institution can make some of the major changes required for the crises that we're facing. So it's, um, yeah, sorry, that's a long way of saying mm -hmm. I kind of got into this with a mix of like idealistic desire to change things and deep seated anger at a racist premier. Well, you, you say that and and we completely support it because the reason we have this show basically falls in lockstep with what you're saying. We were fed up 
with the lies, the misinformation, the disinformation, the lies that are told on a daily basis still today, and, and nobody ever has to answer for them. It's the reason we have this show. We just got so tight. Now, Mr. Beaver had had, had the blog for 10 years, I think, prior. About 10 years, yeah. About 10 years. And then he, you know, we, he just reached out to me and said, would you like to do it? And I'm like, yes, let's do this. Because I was, you know, as a working class citizen in Centertown, Ottawa, I, I, I'm right next door. I've worked on Parliament Hill. I, I'm right next door to it. I have friends who are in politics. I have friends who are members of Parliament right now. Well, former friends. Let's leave it at that. But yeah. <laughs> but we were just uh, so upset at the erosion of, of knowledge, the erosion of information, the erosion of civics knowledge, basic civics. Case in point, the convoy came here to yell at the prime minister when the mandates were provincial. Like you're in the wrong city protesting the wrong government, but I digress. That's the reason we did started this program was to, to, to inform Canadians, let people know you're being lied to and, and we're going to get things wrong. We know that, but we're always pushing to try and get the correct information to the people. You, you took a different pathway than us. I mean, I, I can't go into politics. I've <laughs> too many people have seen me naked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you get into politics it was a racist policy uh, mm. that sparked you and right now we have a situation with something adjacent mm -hmm. it's not necessarily racist but it is an ist mm -hmm. uh, where we have the premier who currently is rather unpopular and he appears to believe that his ticket to rein retaining power goes through some of the most vulnerable members of our society. Uh, not only, and we're talking about transgender people, but not only specifically all transgender people because he's not picking on someone his own size, like adults, but children. And for the most part, children under the age of 16, specifically. Um, what would be your evaluation of the current state of the government? And what would be your case for saying why it is it has to change? Hmm. Well, there's, there's, uh, there's so much to talk about here and it is, um, it's hard to talk about because exactly like you said, going after vulnerable kids. Yeah. Um, a complete disregard for rights, which actually I think is consistent. So, so this premier has no respect for rights, um, with, whether that's First Nations rights or Francophone rights or LGBTQ rights, um, charter rights that have been granted to transgendered people that he just doesn't doesn't respect. Um, so that is the state of the government. We have a, a government that doesn't respect its citizens. We, we actually saw that even more recently with labor rights, mm -hmm. totally trampled over the right to free and fair bargaining. Yes. Um, and, and it's actually led to a really unstable government because there's members of his team that are not supportive. And we saw some of that in the vote on this policy 713 in the House where six members of government voted against their premier, uh, thankfully, although to know it didn't change the result, but it certainly made an important statement and reassured um, some trans kids and vulnerable families um, or vulnerable kids and their families that there were people who um, cared and were going to put their rights first. Uh, yeah, it's and it we're starting to swing further right. Um, we have since seen the premier start to recruit from a far right, from a religious um, perspective mm -hmm. uh, in the candidate pools. We've seen a real turmoil in his party as presidents have written letters for his removal. And there's just, there's lots of stuff happening over there. And the critical work of government isn't getting done. Right. We have right. a health care crisis. We have a homelessness crisis. Right. We have a, had a person lose their life in St. John. Right. Um, just last week, we had someone lose their life in St. Stephen because they were out in the cold, unable to access the services that this government should be focused on delivering. And instead, we're waging culture wars and trying to exploit political wedges with these far right religious overtones. It's it's we've lost the plot. 
right? Like this, Completely. I think this, this premier clearly has the wrong priorities um, and has lost his perspective on leadership um, and is just doing his own thing. He's, you know, he's five years into the job and he's, 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 he's lost perspective. He's lost his team. So his major mm -hmm. advisors have all disappeared um, and been replaced by yes people. So we're in a bad, <laughs> I, it's depressing, but we're in a bad place in New Brunswick right now. It's you're absolutely Jeez. right. And it's frightening when you think about it, how, how the erosion of the system, how, how they have flat out just let's keep people in poverty because we don't feel like investing in them. I'm like, we, we all know it's been proven time and time and time and time again throughout Scandinavia, as an example, that, that getting people off the streets, getting people into homes and giving them basic income costs us less. And that's a progressive conservative policy, the UBI from, from late Senator Hugh Siegel. It, it, it's a money-saving thing, and it improves the lives of all of us because we're spending less money. <laughs> interactions with healthcare, interactions with the justice system, interact all of it. Interactions with police officers. Uh, we were watching the dismantling of a camp in Edmonton, Edmonton. area, right? So where they are going through temperatures like today, the high in Calgary is going to be plus thirty-two, uh, minus thirty-two, minus 32. and they're saying you know it could get down to actual minus forty in Edmonton today. Um, and they're dismantling camps. And that's a lot of money that's going into police resources to dismantle those camps. I'm thinking you could be spending that money on actually providing some temporary housing. Mm -hmm. for some type, so some this is a choice mm -hmm. with how someone's going to spend, uh, this expression I use, how they're going to use our dime on our time and in our name to do that to fellow citizens. Um, Pretty horrible. When you're talking about this government and is losing the plot, how do we correct that? And if you would like, because you've worked with homeless shelters, um, try to, to relate that. Like, For a lot of people, the problem seems so big, particularly when you add the addictions component to it. How do these choices become acceptable to spend money on police officers to get people out of the only home they have when it is minus 32, as opposed to actually housing them yeah yeah it's well it's such a it's such a tough one right the mm -hmm. the housing first model was proven a long time ago mm -hmm. and and yet we haven't adopted it to the extent uh that we should because it has been proven you've just you've just explained the case beautifully right you put a roof over someone's head uh, and you give them stable housing and that gives you the foundation to build all the other supports off of and to then help somebody get to a place where they're fully, you know, fully realized. And, 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 uh, and some of it is ideological, I think, because we've seen with this, this government's housing strategy, there's a real reticence to partner with nonprofit and cooperatives and the folks that are doing the hard yards on the ground to develop supportive housing models um that that's sort of on the fringes and instead they feel still think it's the private sector that's going to solve this for us um which i i disagree with right the mm. private sector has uh, a reason to exist and they're building the profit. kind of housing that generates profit yeah. um but asking them to build non-profitable housing it, it is, is backwards to the the model so agreed and and we can't say it's lack of resources, not in New Brunswick, oh, no. not where we've had a billion dollar surplus. Um, you know, the money has been there and the choice has been made that it was more important to give it to the bankers in New York than mm -hmm. it was to invest it in providing safe and appropriate supportive housing for the people who need it, um, because that doesn't pay off today. It pays off tomorrow or the mm -hmm. next day. Right. And, and we have a very hard time making decisions for the long term because people want the what's in it for me now. Um, and a lot of us do, actually. That's one thing that I'm seeing um, that worries me, too, is that because we've had such a cost of living crunch um, and people are stressed um, people who used to be quite comfortable, middle class are feeling like they're 
holding on to the last rung of the ladder now and about to um about to let go because they're they're feeling the pinch paying their own bills which means i don't I'm, I don't want to share with anybody, right? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm trying to make my own ends meet and I'm stressed out and I'm, I don't, I'm not in a position to think about other people's well-being. I'm worried about my own and my family's. And so we're seeing people less tolerant of immigration, less interested in investing in environmental solutions because it's just, all I can see right now is how am I going to get by tomorrow? And so my ability to think for the long term or support a government that wants to make the important investments structurally in housing and healthcare and education that will help our society actually through these major challenges, I, I don't I don't have any appetite for that. I just want you to make my life easier and more affordable. So when you're trying to have that kind of conversation mm-hmm. with the, the people who decide whether you get the job or not, um, it's really tough. It's tough to, you know, the, the, even though our homeless population has been growing considerably, mm-hmm. it's still not a large voting block. And so the people who vote are the ones saying, I am worried about my comfort. Mm-hmm. And some of them, thankfully, are saying, oh, my gosh, I see what's happening in my community. And I'm deeply concerned for the people who are unhoused, the people who are freezing in the cold. Mm -hmm. And thankfully they're getting louder and louder and they wanna see more action on this at the municipal level. They wanna see more action on this provincially and they're pushing and they're pushing government to do things. And the slow government ship is not responding um, at the speed or at the magnitude that the problem merits. Um, because it's scary and it's mm-hmm. even i'll say this if i can get really political mm-hmm. it's very hard for liberals right now to say we need to spend a ton of money on this because we are tax and spend liberals and mm-hmm. the minute you talk about spending you're just written off as the classic um that, that, that in that classic political position and so we have completely under invested right we've put a hundred million dollars into housing they talk consistently about this this budget they've created that's going to build 380 units. Well, that is now we have 11,000 people on a waiting list for housing. So 380 units ain't going to cut it. It's not um, a drop in the ocean. If you say you're going to spend a billion dollars on housing and healthcare, there's some people who would love that, and there's some people who would would never x that ballot. So there, it's a that's a lot of rambling without a lot of solutions. I'm sorry. It, it sort of makes no, it's point, I guess, quite that all right. there's no silver bullet here. The answers yeah. aren't clear. Um, but more and more people, I think, are seeing that there's such a snowball. If you're not housed, if you're in a precarious situation, if you're living rough, we see the rise in crime that's necessitated because people are, are trying. Desperate people to, do desperate things. Yeah, exactly. And so then people aren't happy with the crime and they're not happy with the visuals. And then we have to tell them, okay, so we can act to fix this. You just have to support it, right? Whether it's a guaranteed livable income and it's it's supportive housing in places that are integrated in your community, you have to be okay with those things if you want to see a reduction in crime and shorter waiting list lines at the ER and you want, you know. Right. Well, so, it's the pay now or pay later concept, right? Mm-hmm. Like this, yeah. or you're but paying most of us it. prefer to pay later. Yes, but yeah, it's yeah. also, but it's also the, you're actually spending the money on it now. It's just not going to solve the problem. Mm. If anything, it's making the problem worse. Right. Because if you're spending the money that you could have shifted to housing on multiple ER visits, you're, you're paying now, just not for the thing you want. Exactly. Right. And, and- yeah, you, that you, transition is the hard part. Right? Yeah, like, and, and, but and you say it was a rambling answer, but it's not a rambling answer in the yeah. sense that with the show we like to um, talk about political literacy and we want to keep it real. And one of the things we try to bits of information that we try to impart to our audience is that sometimes when a promise is not kept, it's not a lack of will. Sometimes it just can't be. And that everything in politics is a trade-off. So, for example, a lot of people say, well, why don't they go in there and they say we're going to spend a billion dollars? Like, you just made it clear because you want, you got to win the race to be able to affect the change. And if you go out there and you make a full-throated, well, in a perfect world, if we had all this money, this is exactly what we'd spend it on and we intend to do some of this, you get ruled out automatically is economically re- responsible and vice versa. You know, if you have somebody who says, we're going to balance the budget no matter what, like, you know, it's like, yeah, we have a roof. We have a hole in the roof of our house like this, but we don't have enough money to pay the roofer this month. So we're just going to leave the hole there. 
And if it rains while there's still a hole and we have more damage to the basement, we're like, well, so be it. But we balance that budget. Right. That's, that's and that doesn't work argument. with a whole other audience either. Yeah. We saw that. We saw our medical society making that that literal metaphor to the public yesterday, right? If your foundation is crumbling, you don't accelerate your mortgage payments. No. Right? Because you won't have an asset worth anything at the end of it. And yet that's what we're doing. We're paying down debt as fast as humanly possible while the roof is leaking, the foundation is crumbling. We'll have all the debt paid off. And what will we have in the end? It's Nothing. a population of poor, sick, unhoused people who, mm. you know, we're going to need to be bailed out by. You know, anyway, all right. So, so something we're talking, you, oh, go, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say something you said earlier that I, I've, I've heard a lot of and read a lot of lately as people go, well, the, this housing problem is because of immigration. I take serious umbrage with that for a number of reasons. One being you can't immigrate to Canada if you don't have a place to live. It doesn't work that way. It, it's, you, you need a sponsor. You need a job. You have to have a specialized skill set. You have to have X number of dollars in your bank account, and you have to have a place to live. Those are the rules when it comes to immigration. So every time I encounter someone and I'm going to be polite here. I won't, I won't call them names, but someone who does not have someone who is ignorant towards the facts, I really get bent out of shape and I have to go offline and go take a breather because otherwise I will go on a, a blue jacket guy swearing rant and, and not everybody is deserving of that. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, but it's like, can I just, can I just, just give you a little bit of education on how the system works? If you immigrate to Canada, you have a place to live. You have a job, you have a sponsor, and you need a specialized skill set. You, you, you know, there's that whole temporary foreign worker thing, but that's a different issue. They tend to work for farms for, for the crop picking season. And that's a whole other kettle of fish we can get onto, but we'll, we'll leave that for another time. Well, and I'm glad you raised it, though, because the anti-immigration sentiment that is rising is also deeply concerning um, mm -hmm. because... Honestly, if we don't immigrate people, we're dead. Then, yeah. Who is going to build the housing that we need? Who is going to provide the health care services that we need? If you go into the local long term care facility uh, down the road here, it is it would it is fully staffed by newcomers mm -hmm. in in LPN roles and personal support worker roles and a whole and a variety of roles, but it wouldn't be open and we would not have places for our seniors to live if it weren't for people Period. who have chosen Canada. Period. And so I really worry that there's this populist view that like we've let in too many people and that's the problem and I can't get health care because there's too many other immigrants waiting for health care. It's like, well, the immigrants are actually also the ones providing the health care yeah. and building the houses and, you know, because there's not enough of us to do it. So I, I, I worry that we are going to watch politicians try to capitalize on that emotion rather mm -hmm. than do exactly what you said, Mr. Grizzly, and, and, and educate and make sure that we can continue to make the case for why um, we, we need people to choose Canada and to help us build, uh, the, the society and the services that we need. So, well, and I know that yelling at people does not help the situation. Uh, yeah. I, I, I know it doesn't. We have to have the calm conversation, which is why I walk away a lot of times. Sometimes I yell because I'm frustrated at the, the, again, misinformation, disinformation, and blatant lack of civics being discussed on a daily basis. For example, the leader of the official opposition here in the federal government goes on and on and on about Justin Trudeau doesn't build houses. Well, no, it's not his responsibility. It's a provincial responsibility and they just dole it out to the municipalities. So the municipality actually builds public housing funded by the provincial government, but because the provincial governments mostly run by conservatives have not been funneling any cash into that for decades. The federal government, who was working on a housing policy since how long has it been, Mr. Beaver? Oh, well, the new housing strategy came about in 2017, but we there haven't you had go. one for decades. There you go. So 2017, new housing, federal policy. And what did the federal government do? Well, Mr. Sean Fraser, you're going to go to the municipalities, give them the cash, get the houses built. And then the premiers go, wait a second now. I'm like, wait, what? So you got mad at him for doing something that wasn't his responsibility. <laughs> So he took it on himself, went directly to the people who will build the houses in the communities where they are needed. And you're mad about that too? I, 
it, we're in an upside down world here. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Just, now, it's, you know, no matter what is done, somebody will f- take umbrage with every aspect of it. And that's the part that can, can we just, can, can we give somebody a win? Can we give humanity and society a win every now and then? This is a good thing that's being done. Mm-hmm. So moving from that, because we've been talking more general, and one of the things that impressed us was that two and a half minute video that you posted about healthcare explaining the situation. You said, and we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And I don't know uh, if your idea caught on because yesterday I saw a video from NDP leader Merritt Stiles in Ontario listing a couple of things that uh, she would do as well with healthcare. And I have to say objectively, it paled in comparison to yours. Um, it was strictly on the employment side with Bill 124, and it wasn't as comprehensive. And my first thought was, hey, bringing solutions, great, but considering how long this has been going on in Ontario, it was like, shouldn't there be a little more meat on the bone than this mm-hmm. when you're presenting the policy? Um, and that's what impressed us. Absolutely. Almost like a little bit of an Elizabeth Warren thing. It's like, I have a plan, <laughs> right? Uh, so when it comes, for example, to, to the homelessness crisis, what would be what would be the elements of your plan? Hmm. Uh, thank you for those comments. I, I appreciate that very much. We, you know, I be, maybe because I'm a nerd at heart, um, I love the policy side of it, and and want to make sure that. It's fr- it's frustrating in opposition that our job is to constantly sort of criticize and hold accountable, and so it it makes me feel better to make sure we're presenting solutions um, that helps mm-hmm. justify the criticism. Honestly, it's oppose um, and propose. Yeah, and we also have to be telling New Brunswickers what we would do, what they could expect from us. So, on the homelessness side, and we've talked about it a little bit. It starts first off with um, a, a shift around how we do policy, because for a long time, we've done one size fits all policy, which I might call one size fits no one. The provincial policy is set and all communities and partners must follow this thing. And in New Brunswick, what works in St. Quentin doesn't necessarily work in St. John, or what works in Miramichi doesn't necessarily work in, you know, Milledgeville. So we need to tailor and partner at the local level. And the first place we need to partner is with listening to the nonprofits and the cooperatives that are building the supportive housing for the people who are trying to transition out of precarious housing and into their first stable situation. Um, So that means both funding, there's very specific bridge funding, financing solutions that they need either to access the CMHC funding requires the provincial government to put the bridge funding, funding commitment in place to allow them to get access to that. Um, they also have a harder time capitalizing new investments and new developments. So there is a, an underwriting component that the provincial government can do to respond to the needs of those nonprofits and cooperatives that want to do it, are ready to do it, have the boards, the volunteers, they've raised the money. They, in many cases, know the sites, know the solutions. And, and maybe I'll, I'll use this opportunity for a positive shout out. There was an announcement just yesterday in St. John with a social enterprise called Kaleidoscope, a social finance enterprise. Federal government's putting four and a half million in. The provincial government's putting 2.7 million in. The community's putting in about a 300K and they're gonna build 36 units for women transitioning from addiction and their children to be housed in a new 36 unit building. That is good work. And I'm glad to see the provincial government there on that. Mm -hmm. Um, It should be the norm, right? We should be partnering in community with a variety of the different community groups that are doing this. It might be John Howard here. It might be housing alternatives there. It might be rising tide there. It might look different in terms of the structure of those entities. So that's the first piece is provide support to the community organizations that are doing the hardest work um, to house the people that need the most support. The second piece is a municipal piece. So municipalities have been telling us that there's a lot of regulatory change uh, and rule changes that need to happen in order for them to be able to um, convert certain lands to acquire, you know, the, if you have back taxes, you can sit there for, I think it's seven plus years and leave a property derelict. We should be able to turn that around a lot quicker, especially in a housing crisis. So how can we change and give municipalities the flexible tools to develop their communities? 
Um, that's one thing they've been asking us for. And then there's a government role. So government has surplus uh, infrastructure that could be prioritized for housing development. Um, instead, if there's an old school, an old DTI garage, an old whatever, it goes into a different stream. It should be prioritized for housing. We should look at all of those assets as could this be housing um, and partner with municipalities to repurpose some of that government surplus. Uh, so that we can, we can, we can use existing structures, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's actually quicker to refit and uh, and make an old school into into housing than it is to start from scratch and build right. from the ground up. So that's a piece of it. There is a financial piece that I'll add in. We need a property tax reform um, because our property tax system in New Brunswick is very blunt. The categories are very blunt. It doesn't recognize affordable housing development. It doesn't do anything to incentivize or encourage that kind of development. So we need to both change our assessment model and then change our property tax categories. We need more of them mm -hmm. so that we can favor and incentivize affordable developments as well as in, in just general developments. We have a pretty non-competitive property tax structure here. Um, so I know this is a little bit in the weeds, but I'm trying to give you the pieces. Oh, okay. So up front, it's partnering with um, community organizations to get affordable. Then it's partnering at the municipal level to fix the regulatory barriers um, that are slowing down development. The property tax system can be changed to incentivize the development of the kind of communities we want. Uh, there's a labor piece for sure. Um, because labor is holding us back on our ability to construct as much as we'd like. So that's where the immigration component that I talked about comes into mm -hmm. play. We need to make sure we are actively streaming in construction skill sets um, along with the educational component of that. So trades education that we've started to integrate back into our high schools. We need to continue to do that at a much greater level so that we have the workforce to help with all these projects that I've just talked about. Um, I'm probably missing some components now, so I apologize for not having it. Um, and then actually, maybe I'll add a little New Brunswick piece. We are one of the leaders in modular housing. Um, we have mm -hmm. companies like Maple Leaf Homes, like Ironwood, like Kent and others okay. that do phenomenal modular housing. And what I'm witnessing right now is Ontario, Nova Scotia coming in and starting to buy up that inventory and that future inventory. And it breaks my heart to think that these amazing New Brunswick companies that are doing, they, they can build housing, you know, in, not on site, right? In, in, mm -hmm. in the winter, they can build right. and turn out amazing units that then can go um, and more rapidly address some yeah, of our- Built indoors in a big warehouse space exactly. where it's protected from the elements, yeah. Yeah, when, people are doing this and, and Nova Scotia and Ontario have caught on that this is one way to, to to get housing developed quickly. Um, so, I mean, great. We we love to export from New Brunswick mm -hmm. businesses, but I would also love to be um, seeing some of those units deployed where we know we want to build. We need to build more houses. We need to address the supply challenge if we're going to um, try to make housing more affordable for everyone. So, uh, yeah, there's there's a piece of making sure we're doing everything we can to to grow our modular housing side and the talent pool that's going to build it and fix the regulatory and the front end, uh, put the investment in the front end to make sure that deeply affordable and supportive housing is available to everybody who needs it. Hmm. You, you say that uh, you say that uh, modular housing, and when I lived in New Brunswick in the '80s, we called them mini homes. And now there's this trend towards the tiny house. And I'm like, that's not a new thing, man. They've been doing that in New Brunswick for 35 plus years, yeah. even longer. And, and like you say, these are modular homes built in a controlled environment, ship them to site, assemble them on site. Well, I mean, assemble, just put them together and away you go. And it can be on a pad or it can be on a foundation. Usually it's on a, a, a pad because they're, they're fully insulated. Their R value is right through the roof. They're brilliantly designed. Yeah. Uh, efficient like more of this please please yeah. oh yeah yeah I'm, I'm loving the trend like that's one thing we do need to change right the mm -hmm. diversity in our housing sector is exceptionally limited you're either in sort of an institutionalized dense apartment block or you're in a single family home on a plot you know like and those two things don't recognize that our we're, our families look more diverse. Mm -hmm. um, we have seniors who want to live uh, at home longer. We need more diverse housing stock uh, and some and modular allows for that, right? Oh, yes. yeah. We just, yeah, we, we've got to think 
about how we plan cities and how we get used to density. I mean, in New Brunswick, that's not a thing, right? No, we, we, right. we get a ton of space. It's one of the reasons that people love it here is because you have access to nature in a minute's, you know, a minute's mm -hmm. drive everywhere. In any direction, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we we need to recognize we're going to need to do some different density things. Uh, I know those are conversations happening all over the country, right? With the fourplexes right. and with the how do we rezone uh, at the at the municipal level to support. Well, we've had debates about rooming houses and mm -hmm. where do they fit in the in the spectrum here in Fredericton. I'm in Fredericton right now. That's a, that's been a city council conversation about whether we um, make space for solutions that we didn't used to uh, think were acceptable. So. Hmm. Well, no. oh, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Please. So I, I wanted to touch on a couple of more, more subjects before our time is up. Um, so that that's housing. Um, when it comes to, we, I normally don't talk about this because I t tend to talk more about the people stuff, but I think in the case of New Brunswick, it would be interesting because a lot of people, if you're thinking about it from, other, that don't don't live there or haven't been there think okay fisheries agriculture i guess and those forestry. areas need pardon forestry forestry and you know those uh urban oil uh you know and these things you know and natural resources do need to be supported and whatnot but what we're talking about economic diversification for new brunswick specifically what would be some challenges and where are areas uh that uh, the province wants to go into for example for let's say you know ai or a green economy or that type of stuff yeah thanks um thanks for taking the conversation in that direction doug because this is my sort of my, my personal bread and butter from when i led the chamber of commerce here and then the new brunswick business council and spent a lot of time in economic development so um thankfully the new brunswick economy has been diversifying probably more than most people um realize and some of that started in the mckenna days right he was the premier mm -hmm. that that saw the information highway opportunities um, and did some things with NDTEL mm -hmm. that were really innovative and created the whole call center sort of back office space that spawned a number of IT startups. Um, and so New Brunswick has gone through these waves of um, of IT leadership. Uh, and, and that's also like as somebody who worked for Cognos and Chalk and Research in Motion and then PQA and into the, the software testing work, um, we actually have a really solid base of IT. Uh, it's less mm -hmm. on the AI side right now. We moved into cybersecurity in a big way back in 2015 or so. And so we've built up, we have the Cybersecurity Institute for Canada here. We have a base of researchers and businesses in cybersecurity. That's probably our one of our sort of niche layered levels of expertise that we contribute both nationally and internationally with the export of services from those companies mm -hmm. all over the place. We continue to push on the value add side of our natural resources. So we have a couple of the traditional and well-known um, companies like the McCain's uh, or the Covered Bridge or the um, Cook Aquaculture that have taken our amazing raw products and added value to them and now export them all over the world or have become global entities. But we have so much more of that that we haven't um, haven't realized yet. Like we have the best apples anywhere. The Honeycrisp apples in New Brunswick uh, are great to go and pick and to take home, but should be turned into higher value product. We're doing that with cider now. We're starting to um, to do it differently. On the green side, um, I wish we had been moving more quickly in this space and particularly in green energy. Uh, so we are far behind where I think we should be in terms of the adoption of um, wind, wind solutions. We actually have a lot of wind asset in New Brunswick. Yeah. Sounds strange to say, but if you look at the maps, the wind blows hard coming down the border that we share with Maine, across the north of the province, and we're very we're underdeveloped in wind, even though it is now it's profitable, right? There's a market right. for mm -hmm. it. There's investment on the table, um, and we haven't been we haven't been tackling that the way that we should. So diving into some of the um, the wind opportunities, there's hydrogen opportunities uh, that exist here. Uh, mm -hmm. Biomass has long been explored and we've never been able to figure it out. Oh, sorry, caucus member calling. Um, 
so there, there's there's opportunities there that actually pair really nicely with our, our post-secondary. So our University of New Brunswick, Mount Allison University, St. Thomas, University of Moncton, our community colleges are actually doing some exceptional work in green energy research and looking for ways that small modular nuclear reactors can work and contribute um, to a decarbonization of our energy infrastructure, trying to maximize you know, our hydro. So that's a place that I think if you uh, if you're watching New Brunswick in the next few years, watch for us to develop more green energy solutions um, because we we need it ourselves and certainly the world mm -hmm. needs it. So um, that's those are some pieces I could yeah. probably go on for a long time about yeah. this topic. Um, that's, I, I'm glad you mentioned that about uh, about uh, wind energy and all those becoming more affordable because actually there was just uh, um, from Max Fawcett from um, the National Observer, there was just uh, something he had posted that said that in 2023, an estimated 96% of newly installed utility scale solar PV and onshore wind capacity had lower generation costs than new coal and natural gas plants. Interesting. Yes. So that's what I mean. If you're paying attention, you got your ear to the ground, that's where you're going. So I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, you're dialed yeah, in. Yes. Like you. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about uh, vulnerable people uh, in a general sense, but if you if you have some specifics for plans uh, and details, I, I'd like them. But how would the francophone community, the indigenous community, trans kids, uh, you know, rainbow people, how do they know that they're safe with you if they vote for you? Oh. That's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think there's two ways that, and and I'll I'll make this broad, right? It, our mission is to earn and deserve the trust of New Brunswickers, and so, you know, some of it is the words, right? We can say that we're standing up for, for the rights of the groups that you mentioned. We have to show it in our actions. Um, and some of that we can do in the legislature where we put forward motions and bills where we oppose and vote against things that trample on the rights of folks. And we push for with our Official Languages Act that comes up for renewal every um, 10 years, I think, uh, and just came up for renewal and was not strengthened. And so we're there fighting for it to be strengthened and proposing ways it can be strengthened and pushing the government to vote in support of strengthening those things. Um, so I think it has to be words and actions, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, and, and to me, what I said in my very first, when I launched my leadership campaign, I put out a video because that's what you do, you know, and pushed it out across the social channels. Um, but it, it borrows from the disability community who started the notion that it, of nothing about us without us. Right. So if you're going to build right. policy that's about someone or for someone, then you should be doing it with them at the center of it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, in technical nerdy policy terms, we talk about the, the analysis lenses that you put on and it used to be gender based analysis and then it was gender based analysis plus and like now we're extending and extending the lenses that we have to apply to policies to make sure that they are not that they recognize the reality of people, um, all sorts of different people. Uh, so that comes by listening, um, by engaging, by bringing people in who can help me understand and who can voice the, the reality of life as a trans person in a particular part of our province or as a francophone somewhere or as a First Nations person somewhere. Um, and we have to be open to flexible policy. So I, I mentioned this before, mm -hmm. right? We've got to get away from one size fits no one. Um, we have to recognize that we we have some things that need to be done a particular way for a particular group. First Nations health is an example of that. First Nations mm -hmm. justice is a different example of that, right? Like there's, we have to be prepared and willing to tailor our policy solutions for the people that they're serving um, and do oh, it with them. So it's, it's, it's building the policy in community with the people that it's about. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't have simple words to reassure um, a trans kid or a francophone or a First Nations person that they're safe with me. Um, mm -hmm. it, it can't be words alone. It has to be actions. The first action is a step out the door and go to them and meet them where they're at and listen um, and then pass the pen 
you know, pass the pen over for them to, to be part of the writing and the designing of the policy um, if it's meant to serve them. Mm-hmm. So that, have- that's the kind of trust that you have to build over repeated do we, behaving that way time and time again so that folks who have been consistently marginalized for generations can start to build some sort of trust that this might be different. Mm-hmm. We have that also in the in, in the community. I'm, I'm a member of the Rainbow community and back in the days of the HIV and AIDS crisis, um, that was a principle that was very important back then. We called it the JIPA principle there, the greater involvement of people most affected. Uh, so it's the same concept of a nothing, you know, nothing about us without us. And uh, it, it's been very effective if we look at, uh, you know, the global uh, fight to stop the spread against HIV and AIDS. Mm-hmm. It's uh, today the International AIDS Conference is the largest scientific conference in the world because there's a whole community-based research component involved in it. And it's treated as equal to the hard sciences when we uh, when we get to that uh, to that conference. So it, it's a model that is proven and does in fact work very 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 well. Yeah. Thank I'm, you for I'm, that. I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that. GIPA, greater involvement of people most affected. Yeah, GIPA, GIPA, they call it the GIPA principle. If you re- look it up on the on the web, there's a, there's a whole ba- history and background of it, uh, in terms of its origins within at least uh, the gay community, and the HIV community. Thank you for that. Um, there's so many things that I could talk about. Uh, I've got a whole list of topics here right beside me, and uh, I know that we have a we we I mean we. You've been very generous with your time, but I know we also have limited time to a certain extent. Um, I wanted to, there's an election coming up. And from your perspective, because technically it's scheduled for October, but there is a sense that it could be happening any time. Um, mm-hmm. Because again, I'm, it seems that the premier is more focused right now on his own personal political advantage. And if he sees a moment at, at any given time where somebody might t- take a stumble or whatnot, you know, we'll pull a plug because you know, everybody puts their foot in their mouth at some point or says something that comes out wrong and you got that clip that goes along, you know, and say, okay, now's a good time. Um, where t- for you, what would you see are the expected challenges for your party in terms of communicating your message effectively so that you can win the election and where are the opportunities that you see that you might have some lanes that you can occupy? Hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, that certainly is what's occupying us right now as we know officially we're in an election year and that it could be coming as soon as the spring. Um, so we see lots of opportunity actually, um, in part because there's so much frustration not only directed towards this premier, but within his party. So there are conservatives looking for a place to put their vote. That presents interesting challenges for us politically, um, because while our party has always been sort of a big tent middle party, Mm -hmm. um, I have two poles in my party that I'm trying to keep together with people that are more to the right and people that are more to the left. Mm -hmm. And I I would argue that the other parties on other sides of us are are tighter in their place on the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, but we we have a broad group of in our members who have in some cases very different views on issues and mm-hmm. keeping all that together in what I call the messy middle. Um, and then you're articulating nuanced policy, which is harder to communicate, right? It's much easier in an election campaign to, to campaign to the extreme, right? To pick of that. Course that spicy, sexy policy that's a little maybe further outside of where you would normally be. But when you're normally the centrist party, that that spicy, sexy stuff is not... Uh, um, it's not really available to you. Yeah, it's, it's not part of our DNA. But on the flip side right now, people don't want the drama that this government is bringing. They just, like you guys said at the outset, they want someone to be the adult in the room. Mm-hmm. They want something that is balanced, pragmatic, right? Like it just looks out for the common good. I think there, thankfully, there is a unity in our party about we look after our neighbors, right? right. We're not just looking after individual benefit. We are looking after our neighbors. Hmm. Um, and our party is always going to care about everyone having an equity of access and everybody, regardless of who they love or where they live or what language they speak, has the opportunity 
um, to access services and to fully live as themselves in New Brunswick. Um, but I think that, I mean, communicating to people who don't care and are switched off, right? This, this apathy is really challenging. Managing both a declining traditional media landscape and trying to be in the conversations that people are at, whether that's Instagram or YouTube or TikTok or Facebook or the coffee shop, you know, trying to be everywhere. The amount that you have to communicate, the amount of time we spend on communications it's insane. Um, and trying to balance that with the time we spend doing policy development and, you know, where you put your resources is um, those are constant sort of campaign strategy questions. Um, you know, but we have, and we have the classic, like, these are the ridings we think we can win, right? There's probably 13 pickups that we think are, uh, are available to us. And so, you know, we're looking at those communities, um, even though most of our messaging is broad, this election is about mm -hmm. healthcare. It's going to be about cost of living and housing, and it's going to be about education. Preferably it'll be about approach. Right? Because I think that's what needs to change. Fundamentally, mm -hmm. it's the approach of governing. We can't govern from Fredericton and from Chancery Place anymore. We need a government that's going to get out of the office and actually give the power back to communities so that communities can build the solutions that reflect them and, and look and suit them and their needs. And they need a courageous government that's prepared to share or give away that power to that community organization, that municipality, that whomever, to do the right work that's closest to the people. Whether that's healthcare delivery that looks like a community clinic that is designed for the population it's serving, or whether that's the educational solution, the school that is a community school that has multiple uses and that suits its rural area or the dynamic that it's serving in. So, we need to change the approach of government. I hope that people will vote for that. I know it's more likely that there will be an issue that mm -hmm. is decided, you know, what, six or eight weeks out from the election, there'll be an issue, car insurance or toll highways or shale gas, or you, it's hard to predict the thing that will be the issue. It better not be parental rights because that's bullshit. But anyway, completely. Um, well, we could go back to that conversation. I know someone who wants to make it about parental rights. We think it should be about respect for New Brunswickers and building a society where everyone has access to the services they need because government has gotten away from itself and let tailored community-based solutions emerge and has facilitated that um, with a more flexible, you first, you know, greater involvement of the people most affected kind of principle. So I hope people see our approach of communicating authentically, getting away from whipped scripted party lines, making sure that we elect people who will represent their constituents first, right? It's, it's, it's your, your riding over your party. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that. And I, that's I'm how the system works, right? The, making change to the liberal party so that we can do that, um, that our, our, our rules allow for it. Um, because we have to earn the trust back, right? It's about earning trust. So you need authentic people communicating honestly, being their true selves, mm -hmm. earning the trust of the electorate by listening, by partnering, and by you know making space for other people at the table and sharing the the power with them. Mm -hmm. There's something you just said a second ago that that really rings true is that parental rights is bullshit. Mm -hmm. Parents have responsibility. Children have rights. And that seems to get lost in that whole ins uh, ridiculous conversation, ignorant conversation, because it's mm -hmm. ignorant. Mm -hmm. And and the fact that you 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 are on the side, the right side of history on this one, just makes me like you all the more. Yep, we had. And you know uh, what I'll say, thankfully, because I have a number of members of my caucus who represent different. I mean, I'm I'm in urban Fredericton. It's a you know mm -hmm. really progressive people here. Oh yeah. Um, highly educated, you know, it's, it's, and, and my, my writing of Bathurst, East Nabisco St. Isidore, uh, it's totally different makeup, but mm -hmm. when the, for, the issue of policy 713 first came to our caucus, there was unanimous. It was clear for everyone, regardless of the price they might pay in their communities, that the right thing to do is to defend vulnerable kids and right. to support children's rights. Um, so thankfully, that was unanimous and clear from the start across our caucus. Good. Um, and we've Good. watched the Premier try to manipulate the issue and try to pull the wool over New Brunswickers' eyes and convince them that teachers are nefariously out there to indoctrinate their children. It's so dangerous. Mm -hmm. Eroding trust in our education system, creating disrespect for teachers, like it's bullshit. Um, yeah. 
and thankfully, like, you know, the member, and, and I think, I think the people actually aren't, like, they think this is a majority position that like some survey sometimes said 75% of people support parental rights. Sure. Look at how you worded that question. Mm -hmm. But when we ask the people, what do you think about this? What do you think about schools and, and being flexible about how we make sure that kids are accompanied on a journey? It, it's not a majority of people that support what the premier is talking about. No. He's mm -hmm. into the 30%. I think it's even shrinking with every time he opens his mouth on this now because we see him bringing in people from away mm -hmm. who are pseudo experts to try and sell this to the public, to the bureaucracy. It's like, it, it's so questionable. It's like, it's so wrong mm -hmm. um, that he's spending all his time trying to convince people that he's right on this and bringing bringing people from outside to try and tell us that he's right when social yeah. workers, psychologists, teachers, and experts say this is not how you handle kids who, you know, are exploring different pronouns, who are trying to figure out their identity, right? Like, mm -hmm. well, I'm I, glad I you... The, go, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because we had Sean Rouse on our show right where I was going. a while ago, and he's the parent of a transgender child. <clears throat> and when people are speaking about parental rights, we're not talking about the rights of all the parents because he's a parent mm -hmm. and right. his rights are not being respected. If we're talking about parental rights, if that were a thing, but as Mr. Grizzly says, there's not parents have responsibilities. Children have rights. And that I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, that you think it's bullshit. And I was wondering two things. One, um, because you talked about the messy middle and we talk about this a lot in the show mm -hmm. too, how it's, you know, certain parties have to, you know, balance what's going on. Has any of those six members of the Progressive Conservative Party who sort of abandoned Mr. Higgs approached yours? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, in New Brunswick has an amazing child and youth advocate, Mr. Kelly Lanrock, who studied this and put out an absolutely exceptional report. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, children's rights in that, in the sense of, for example, for the advocate, but also maybe include, uh, which is a topic that's important to me, uh, and people that often get overlooked, but the rights of foster children specifically, youth in care and youth at risk. Mm. Because we know that a lot of these kids who, there's about 40% of street youth that identifies as rainbow, for example. And a lot of these kids sometimes leave their homes and then bounce in and out of foster care as well. So just you know it, it's a, it's a big messy it's a sort of a messy question because it kind of goes all over the place but well i mean you you've just sort of explained why we need policy 713 um lgbtq kids are overrepresented in youth in care in mm -hmm. youth in um engaging with the law youth experiencing homelessness um, because they have had unstable or unsupportive situations at home uh, and now we're trying to get rid of a policy that would sort of force the creation of an unstable situation at home when we've seen the rates of suicide among these kids are elevated right these this, these are reasons why the policy was created in the first place was to make sure that kids had a safe place at school um, where they could, uh, they could, they could address those issues rather than keeping them bottled in and having it end up in suicide, and mental health, and homelessness, and addiction, Cutting. in like it. So, mm -hmm. we we have abysmal services for youth in care. I will say, mm -hmm. like the the situation is, we have a shortage of social workers. We have a shortage of support for residential solutions. Um, we have laws that you've described, they're sort of barriers to, to youth getting access to both the autonomy and the resources they need to work their way um, through. We have really harsh cutoffs where you go from having support to being totally on your own without any sort of transition support. Um, there's also a religious element there that needs um, that needs regulatory change. But anyway, it's... Yes. There's so much more. And actually, the good news is, if, if you love Kelly Lamrock, I believe that his um, his work plan for this year includes a focus on youth and care. Um, and right now, we're waiting for him to come out with a, a long-term care report and review. He did do exceptional work on Policy 713. 
Um, the policy that he recommended go forward is the one that our party has said, we would implement this um, at the first opportunity. We will make the changes to the policy the advocate recommended to make sure um, that children's rights are respected um, and that we do not discriminate in our schools because this government has put forward a discriminatory policy um, that I don't think will hold up in the court of law, but who knows how long that lawsuit is going to take mm. to work its way through the court system. Um, trying to go back to your first question. So New Brunswick is a small place. We all mm -hmm. know each other and we mm -hmm. all talk all the time. Mm -hmm. So certainly the six members who voted against um, the uh, the government on policy 713 are people that we have been in, in dialogue with consistently because some of them are friends um, and people that, that I knew before politics and before they were in politics, right? People like Jill Green and I, you know, used to used to golf at chamber golf tournaments when she was leading a business and I was doing something else. So we, um, we are in constant conversation with not just them, but, um, but pretty much everyone in the ledge, because this is, this is a small province and um, whether it's Dominic Hardy or David Kuhn or, or Jeff Carr or Dorothy Shepard or Trevor Holder, we're talking all the time about, about policies, about parties, about who's going to do what next, um, and looking for opportunities to collaborate. It's a it's a tricky space, um, and I'm sure there's probably research been done on like floor crossing and party changing and things like that, um, because disloyalty is not um, well. It, it even the word I just used, right? Disloyalty that's a negative thing, mm -hmm. right? Choosing something different because you think it's better. Um, is hard to do, particularly if you've identified with a particular party for a long time. As, I mean, I named Jeff, Dorothy, Trevor. These are longtime progressive conservatives moving to the enemy. You know, you know, the, the Liberal Party has right. been the enemy for most of their careers. It's super hard move to make. Yeah. Um, you know, there either has to be a very deep, sort of principle and connection. And right. these are people of integrity and we saw that in their votes. Right. Um, but it's sensitive, you know, I'm not out there strong arming and putting a high pressure recruitment push on them, but we have conversations all the time. Um, on the flip side, I'm actually looking for new politicians. If we wanna change political behavior, one of the best ways to do that is with people who haven't built the bad habits in the first place. Right. Um, and so the people that I mentioned are all great folks, but they have the habits of a 30 year political career that has taught you to do things this way. And if I wanna change political behavior, then a great way to do that is recruit new politicians who don't, don't have the bad habits. So really I'm out talking to people who have maybe never been partisan before um and have decided it's time to get involved and make change uh, as well as talking to people who might be blue green orange or otherwise um because because the system needs to change mm -hmm. uh, i'm glad you mentioned <clears throat> sorry i've got a frog in my throat <clears> throat> uh what you did about uh um a hard uh hard to find lines for transition when you're in care um when i was in care um we're talking a while ago, a couple of decades ago, um, but through the Children's Aid Society of Ottawa, they actually had a pilot project going on that I thought would have gone national at some point, and I guess it never did, that was called a semi-independent living program, where they identified foster kids at around 15 and 16, and they would bring them somewhere and teach them, you know, basic nutrition skills, cooking skills, how to manage a house, how to manage a budget, and when the they were transitioning out of care around the age of 18, they would give them a stipend if they were continuing education up until to the age of 21 to help them. So it was similar, a stipend that was similarly equivalent to what welfare was at that time to help them transition as they were moving out of their foster care and then going off to university. And I have to say that saved my life. I guess I am a reasonably well-adjusted person who doesn't say morally, object morally objectionable things and has built a decent life for myself. I'm now a homeowner. Nobody in my family had ever owned a home at all um, for me. And that transition program was one of the key elements because other not, otherwise, I was one of those kids when my foster parents, my foster parents found out I was rainbow a couple of years before I moved out, but on the very day I moved out, even though I had been a ward of the state and in that home for 10 years, as I was putting the last box in the van, 
moving out to where I was going to go with semi-independent living. That's when they asked me, are you gay? I said, yeah. And I've never had any contact with them ever since. They just shut me out even though I lived there for 10 years. Yeah, that's kind of heartbreaking, right? It's just no family, no nothing, no place I could go for Sunday dinner, no place I could bring my laundry to do it like this. I was literally on my own. If that was not there, yeah, we may yeah. not we may not be having this conversation today. In all likelihood, you would have been one of those uh, abandoned children on the street somewhere. I mean, realistically, that's that's not hyperbole. That's a very realistic, you know, possibility. Yeah. So that program saved your life, right? Yeah, the essential life skills and a little, you know, wasn't enough for my own apartment, but, you know, somebody had a room in theirs and I was able to, you know, that was enough to cover that. And then from that point on, you know, OSAP came in and then, you know, student loans and then I was on my way. But had not that, had not that been there when I loaded that last box in, that was it. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're on your own, kid. And you can't come back here. So it's, if there are policies like that that could be developed, they would be very, 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 very helpful. Yeah. Somebody speaking from experience, lived experience. Hmm. Um, Katie told us that we have about 90 minutes and we're at 90 minutes. Um, I'm guessing that you have something that you need to to do so we will respect that time even though there's so much more <laughs> I, know, I know there's like we had this whole list of topics and we we yeah. haven't talked french immersion we haven't talked uh, yeah we, plenty, we can do it again whenever yes. you're free let yeah. us know we'll have Absolutely. you back we'd love to yes and uh, as we um, um mentioned um the New Brunswick collection is something that we are going to have a very strong focus on over the course of the year. And uh, every now and then we do live election result shows. We probably will do one for mm -hmm. uh, New Brunswick. So if you members of your team, uh, we're also open to members of the NDP and Green Party and even the Conservative Party. Yeah, if you would like to come on, there's a place here. But if you want to talk policy, if you want to talk what, uh, what your plans are, in the lead up and during the campaign, please, you're welcome here. Uh, if you want to participate in our live elections uh, results show and stop in for a couple of minutes, you're more than welcome. Um, we want to give our listeners, whether they live in New Brunswick or not, and our viewers, a real sense of how it, how it actually does work. Mm -hmm. Because we, we ought to bring political literacy and media media literacy and civics and that it's it's not just about I'm standing in front of a lectern and saying, I'm, you know, it's broken. I will fix it. It's like how we'll provide a solution. Yeah. Why? Like, you know, so it, it's it's more complicated than hey, you know, just ax the tax and the mm -hmm. problem is solved. There there are trade-offs. There are different stakeholders, there are competing interests. Like you said in your party, you have, you know, you have red Tories and orange liberals and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you, you get pulled and you have to try to bring everyone in. And that creates a real politic on the ground that politics is not just about saying that thing that will fit on a bumper sticker. Well, it's actually hard work. That's a mm -hmm. lot of compromise, yeah. right? That's like, you personally, that's the hardest part, right? Like that's you, the name of the game is compromise in politics, right? Yeah. Yeah. But hard when you, people have an, a, an attention span for ax the tax. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's never that simple, nope. um, and we do a disservice when we sort of simplify to that level. But on the flip side, it, you got to communicate in ways that are memorable and clear. And anyway, so thank you for having me. I really appreciate yes, you, you you reaching out um, and, and connecting and offering me the opportunity to come. You have an amazing community here. I've sort of been wishing that I could jump in on the chat because. Uh, uh, there's a great crowd there that um, seem to really care for each other as well. I love yeah. the, the community. That yeah, they're pretty have. amazing. Yeah, um, they're really and Mr. Grizzly, your voice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like you have this right? amazing, well, amazing you. sort of podcast and radio voice that I've just been loving. And, and Douglas, your your spirit, your smile from yeah. the very first minute we've interacted. It's been um, it's been so, so warm and wonderful. So thank you. I'd love to come back. Um, and so, I mean, I am going to come back and we'll do this in French yes, uh, and will. then we'll see about, uh, about the next visit. Thank All you right. Thank you, for having me. you are definitely welcome here at the Beaver Lodge. You have a home here thank you. and good luck to you.
Hey, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'll take all the luck I can get. Fight hard. <laughs> yeah. Just put thank a link you. in the chat on the YouTube if if uh, if you like my voice and you want to hear more. There's an ASMR YouTube channel that talks about mental health. You can check it out. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Right. Oh, look, you can write in the chat. I should oh, have yes. asked for the way that I can do that. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you for the kind comments and for the participation. Happy Friday. Thank you, for your thank time. you so much. Have take a great weekend. Bye bye. Dude, that was oh. awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. I can't wait to have her back. Oh. Like you said, uh, an adult who does politics in full sentences. My goodness gracious. Did she uh, did she stammer once? Nope. In 90 minutes? Nope. Did she nope. stutter once? Did she trip on her like Nope. That's amazing. You you, you know, kids that it's sincere and it's from the heart mm -hmm. when you can talk so casually. We don't give the questions. Um, obviously, when we interview politicians, they ask, you know, do you have like a variety of subjects so that I can prepare for, you know, and, and literally, was, um, Mr. Grizzly, if you, um, mm, I don't know how to show this without showing some personal stuff, unfortunately, for my, but so I, I can't show you the screen because okay. it, it's my email feed and then there's oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. other names on it. Um, but the list that we had, how she got into politics, her passion for politics, her team, assessment of the current government, policy 713, the seeming intent to go after gender affirming health care, the current health care crisis and the video that brought her to our attention, using the surplus to address debt versus provide services, French immersion or post-secondary education, diversifying the economy, countering disinformation, the impending election expected challenges, opportunities, areas of policy outside health and education for which she has a passion, basic income, addiction slash mental health, foster care. That's it. We didn't even supply like a question. Like we would like to know what her policy is or how she plans to address it. Literally just the topic. Mm -hmm. And she was able to speak. This is a, a, a lawlessly. This is a person who is deeply committed to improving the lot in life of everybody who lives in the province of New Brunswick. Everyone. This is a person who wants to make the world a better place. We need more people like this. When we say compare your candidates, not to the Almighty, but to the alternatives. Mm -hmm. This is a standard. This is a standard that you should be looking for. This, what Susan Holt provided on this interview, is, or a lot of people are amazed, that should be the minimum price of entry. Correct. When parties are vetting candidates, these are the minimal skills mm -hmm. that they should have if the focus and the priority is you, your needs, serving you, providing a public service, actually being a servant to the public, not just the public that votes to them or votes for them or looks to them, but all the public. I have a lot of friends and family in New Brunswick, and I am going to be uh, sending every single one of them this interview, this episode this show so that they can understand that this is a person who cares deeply about every single citizen of the province of New Brunswick. This is somebody who wants to bring about change for the better for everyone. Mm -hmm. And says, um, Kit Saucy says here in the Con chat, concrete, legitimate, yes. realistic, attainable goal. I think you were, you, yeah, you, you uh, got choppy a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Restream is misbehaving. As Kit Saucy said, he says, this is why Higgs is going bananas. He knows he can't compete on a fair level. And he certainly can't compete on that level. No. Side by side, if we were to ask him the same questions, we would not get that. No, you wouldn't. We would get that. Compare your alternatives to each other. Look for genuinely good people look for people who don't speak about fellow Canadians in disparaging terms. As we keep mm -hmm. on saying, we're not anti-conservative. We're anti-arsehole. Yeah. 
we're not. We're not anti-conservative. And, and for those who, you know, everybody, oh, are you liberals? I'm like, I'm not a liberal. I'm not. I, I don't belong to any political party and I never will. And I say that all the time. And I have friends who identify as, well, I'm a conservative. And I stop them and I go, you are a progressive conservative. There's a tremendous difference. You are of the, the era of Joe Clark. That is the kind of conservative that you are. And they're like, well, yes, that's true. And I go, well, you need to make sure people understand that because the current crop of conservatives. In it's just a branding thing for them. That's all it is. And they're like, you know what, Paul, you're right. I go, I know you have, I know you've been voting for the new NDP, the new Democratic Party lately, because you do not have a party anymore. Your party disintegrated 20 years ago. It doesn't exist. So if you're going to say you're conservative, say you're a progressive conservative first, capital P, because otherwise people are going to get the wrong idea. And, 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 and I've always been thanked for that. And we don't see eye to eye on policy on everything, but literally we're, we're this far apart on, on the vast majority of right. it. Like, right. Right. You know, <laughs> the, 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 when I say it, it's a branding thing, it is right. Mm -hmm. When we look at the federal, it was a hostile corporate takeover of the progressive yes. conservative brand. And then they appropriated all the goodwill that was associated with that brand until a certain number of people took them a couple of so took them almost a decade for certain of them, but to figure out that Harper was not that. No. And that current party is not that. Because there is nothing genuinely conservative about that party. No. So when we're talking and Dan, Dan says here, good people with good ideas is where it's at, regardless of, of the stripe. political stripe. Yeah. Adults in the room, people who do not insult your intelligence, People who do not look at you straight in the face and talk to you and say things that no matter what it is that they're saying, translate to, I think you're stupid and I'm treating you as such. Mm -hmm. The electrician gets lightning from the sky. And he's extraordinary. Not extraordinary. Extraordinary. He's not just ordinary. He's super ordinary. That's an insult. Yes, it is. It's not the flex he thinks it is. People who talk about people in elevating terms, not debasing. Mm -hmm. These things matter. Oh, yes. Whatever frustrations you are experiencing now, whatever hardship is the person that comes in and says the reason you're going through hard times is them and points to the people that you should hate or despise. They are not your friend. No, they are not. And they will not help you. They, they will, will not you be served by that. Yeah. They don't care. They will not be served by that. And everyone you care about will not be served by that this you need people that are willing to have 90 minute conversations mm -hmm. about a wide range of topics and actually have a conversation not explain to you why it is that you're wrong not somewhere along the way tell call you that you say that you're a cuck or a communist or a pedo or a groomer or make assumptions about what you must believe or who you, who you probably vote for, or who pays you or make assumptions about your life because they don't know you and they have no way of possibly knowing that you don't need people that express wishful thinking as a fact. Indeed. You need people that are willing to say, you know what? Uh, I got to speak in broad terms here because I don't have specifics or, you know, or this is messy or this is a trade-off. And they're saying like, you have to understand like this, I would love to come in and say this, but I have my party's big tent and I have people on this side. Like right now what's going on with the federal liberals with Palestine and Israel. There are parts of the party that are, pulling more towards Israel. There are parts of the party that are pulling more towards Palestine. 
But so long as everybody in that party remembers that it's about being pro-human, that discussion can take place respectfully. Indeed. And I, I, I got to step away quickly. Sorry. I'll be right yeah, back. And, Apologies. and Susan Holt made that point when she was talking about policy 713, that it didn't matter whether her team was rural, whether it was Francophone, whether it was urban, whether it was, they all agreed on the basic principle that you do not go after vulnerable children. And now that Premier Higgs seems to be about wanting to go not only after the right to have the basic respect of just being called what it is they would like to be called, but is actually going for their gender affirming health care, proving what Mr. Rouse said, you know, when they said, oh, it's not about trans kids and it's not about the trans thing. It's about parental rights. It's like, well, if you're going after a kid's health care and saying you can't have it anymore, it is about the trans kids and it is about the transgender thing. If you're starting to limit access to bathrooms, is it? It is about the trans thing. So at, at some point, you got to call a thing a thing. And you can't be afraid to do it. And you need to look for the politicians. Even if it means saying bullshit on camera. To leave that, oh, I need to be the perfect polished politician who never drops an F-bomb and never says bullshit or you know, never lets my anger show. Mm -hmm. I have to be daddy or mommy knows best. I have to be infallible. The person who's willing to live that, leave that and say, I don't know, or say, you know what? This makes me mad, damn it. And it should. They represent people. So we have to allow our, our politicians the opportunity to be people. And yes, Moan, kids are people too. Damn straight. Individual persons with their own individual inherent rights as guaranteed by our Constitution, as signed on to internationally with the International Convention on Human Rights and the International Convention on the Rights of the Child. We've made promises to the world by signing those conventions that we would treat our fellow citizens and we, we, we would treat children in a certain way. And if we don't live up to that, we failed. Well, not only have we failed, but we're telling the rest of the world, one, it's okay to do that. And two, that our word has no value that we cannot be trusted. You can't send that message and expect it to do well as a country. No. You just can't. You have to be consistent. You have to be coherent. And you have to be constant over time and across the board. These things matter. Yes, they do. Oh. I am feeling good. Well, you damn well should be. A great I'm start to the day, sir. Fired up. I'm fired up. No, I'm. No, you have every right like, to be in a good way. Oh yeah, no, no, not no. like not let's anger. go to the barricades and fight the like. I'm just like that whole democracy something like. I I want to go out and vote. Or right, it <laughs> like, or knock on some doors or <laughs> send up some pamphlets. I want to just like ah, what am I going to do today? You know, to, what am I going to do today to make the world a better place? To make my country better? What do I, you know? Just. I love these types of conversations. I hope it's the same for you kids that you feel that energy and that hope. Listen, that, that sense that as we keep on telling you on the show, no matter who you are, no matter what skill set that you have, that you have something that you can bring this and especially viewers at home uh, and listeners who will be hearing this later who have, disengaged from politics because the zone has been flooded with so much bullshit and you have a whole bunch of clowns that have made the public square just unbearable to be in. 
we need you to come back. Not check out. This is the time, if you've checked out, this is the time we need you to get back into the game. There are more of us than there are of them. There will be three provincial elections this year, one in British Columbia, one in Saskatchewan, and one in New Brunswick. And the one in British Columbia and Saskatchewan right now look like it's going to be maintenance of the status quo. In British Columbia, that's not so bad. There's an NDP leader there, and you know, even though he has challenges, he seems to be at least trying to do certain things right. We just had the announcement in British Columbia about uh, the kits, for example, for cervical cancer. For women over there, they'll be sending people kits, and there's a new testing system where they will be testing mostly for HPV instead of the typical pap smear, which is very invasive because it seems that science has shown us that 70% of cervical cancers have the HP virus as the root cause. Mm -hmm. So we're switching the system to test more for that. That's not going to eliminate the pap smear, of course, and it will still be needed for other things. But science has said that this is the way to detect a greater number of cancers and cancers at an earlier stage to help people. So we know better. We're doing better. We're changing the system. It's a small thing in one specific area of policy, but it shows that you have a government that's evidence-based. In Saskatchewan, unfortunately, we have Premier Mo, Mo, who thinks it's an appropriate thing to unleash the Constitution on transgender youth, and for some reason, I still can understand it, he has a high approval rating. So yeah, unless something incredible happens that throws him off his rocking horse, there's going to be Mo Mo, unfortunately. But New Brunswick is the province is the province this year where there is an opportunity to move from a conservative government back to one that actually cares about people. Well, more money, more problems in Saskatchewan, right? It really, really matters this year. So please, because if you've watched this morning from New Brunswick, or if you watch later, because you've seen this promoted and you say, hey, I know her. I'm going to watch this one. And you, you've stuck around this long. Just get engaged. Make sure that when election time comes that you plan your vote. Make sure that you bring people to the polls with you. Because friends don't allow friends to do democracy alone. Talk to your families. Have that conversation. If you have that drunk uncle that makes that rude pro-Trump common. Just tell them in front of your family members why he's wrong. Family mm -hmm. members go, oh, oh, don't start anything. Start something. Should start something. Let them know how important it is to you. These are the conversations that matter. It's time to get in the game, Canada. It's time to get in the game. Oh, I'm energized. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I love this kind of stuff. We've had a heck of a week of shows. My goodness. Uh, Sean Rouse, uh, Pete, Creek Pete, uh, Susan Holt, uh, the, the, the official liberal leader and leader of the loyal opposition of the province of New Brunswick. Yeah, I don't think we've ever had three interviews in one week yet. I don't think so. And, and I believe that um, Susan will be the next premier of New Brunswick. I have every reason to believe it. I would be surprised. I'm shocked out of my mind if she wasn't. And I say that because I, I believe that uh, people will hear her message and heed her call. And not only that, they're not too happy with the current state of affairs in New Brunswick. There's a $2 billion surplus. And what is he spending the money on? Pain Certainly isn't health care. Nope. I mean, that's obvious. Talk to anybody in the province, they'll tell you, you got to wait forever to get in to see anybody in an ER situation, not going to see your doctor at the doctor's office. That has always been what it has always been, and that's not changing. The doctor has X number of patients, and it takes time to get in. 
but triage in an ER where people are waiting up to 40 hours. What was it? One hospital was at 360% capacity, if memory serves. Uh -huh. Good Lord, man. Well, and the other you're, one and you're sitting 12, on $2 billion. And one hospital had 12 ambulances like in a row in a line waiting. Yeah. It's just, uh, um, the kits, uh, seem to have really appreciated this. Yeah. Get James seriously. Best interview thus far on your podcast. Um, Thanks, man. my friend coming from you when yeah. we get compliments we consider the source and uh you've had if somebody knows how to interview he's friends with noam chomsky for christ's sake <laughs> yeah so um thank you and i hear that you might be doing a casual tonight um i'm sitting alone at home by the phone so you know <laughs> i'd be happy to join in i might tonight. be able to pop in for a bit tonight um wow i like that uh the kits here on there's just oh kit saucy says that we should probably clip that monologue of mine at the end <laughs> oh, yeah i will I will. <laughs> that out. ah thanks so much that's really sweet i just saw that <laughs> go by it was um kit linda normalized talking about politics intelligently and um, Kits and Cubs at the early of the show, uh, well, it seems that uh, Kit Linda is celebrating an anniversary. So oh, happy anniversary, baby. dear. <laughs> Hope the weather cooperates. And Kit Elaine, you are uh, making great progress in your recovery where that brings us joy. We saw that early on it in does. the chat too. We didn't have time to do the romper room thing because we just got into it. Um, but yeah, I am. Um, all right. We have a show. We have a show. We do. Yeah. Because I'm just having some now. technical glitches today, but hopefully that'll be resolved because I have a new computer coming in today. Yes. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully that's all resolved. It's probably going to take me by the part of the day to get the new computer set up, but um, time will tell. We shall see. It's going to be, I, I got to, I got to clean off my console because I've got stuff everywhere right now. I'm not even going to show you. It's such a mess. And I have OCD and ADHD, but the console needs to get cleaned up so that I can have the space for the computer to be placed right there. It's a Mac mini for those of you who are curious, because I spoke to a number of professionals who said for what you're doing, this will, this will float for you. No problem whatsoever. I'm like, really? He goes, Oh yeah. To, to, because of the way they've restructured and redesigned. And I'm not an Apple guy. I'm not, but if it's going to benefit the show and I have every reason to believe from all the experts that I've spoken to, um, that this will make a huge difference for us. I'm like, let's do it. Let's make it happen. Pull the pull the trigger on it. Don't know how I'm going to pay for it, but pull the trigger on it. <laughs> like I said, we'll 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 figure that out. Yeah, we'll right. figure that out. Um, oh, you can okay. see I'm blurry as all get out right now, and I have no reason for that. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, because you shut down everything. Everything is shut down. My my CPU is at fifty three percent. My memory's at twenty six percent. My disk is at one percent. My that really should not be happening. Then. Yeah, so I don't know what's going on. Yeah. We have a Kit Mystical here says, hopefully other politicians hear about this and come on. This was such a good show. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Kit Saucy. Every morning, that's why I keep showing up to the lodge and hanging with the damn fan. Wow. Thank you, Kits. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Kits. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, Kits and Cups, that's the end of this episode of the True North Eager Beaver Interview Project and the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because I really loved making this for you. <laughs> and we, of course, love making this for you. I can only speak for, the, for myself on this one, but I, I have a feeling Mr. Grizzly feels the same on this one. Please share um, this with everyone. Yes. Please. This please. is, it's, you know, it's important that people see that there are politicians in this country who actually do like the citizens that they represent, they actually do like this country, in this case, love this country, and want to do better for everyone. Everyone. Yep. Show them when they say, oh, they're all the same, that they're not the same. They're not. They're not all the same. Not all the same. It's too easy to say. That's another axe the tax. They're all the same. Mm hmm Go deeper, go deeper. Um, sharing is caring. So as Mr. Grizzly says, share this. Surtout nos amis, nouveaux brunswickois et nouveaux brunswickois. We're going to have something for you as well in French. 
Oh, I'll be sending this out to family members today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl, fabulous, fierce, wonderful, sponsoring our pod page. So that little squiggly that you see under my chin, that'll bring you right there. So if you scan that while you're watching, or if you go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words, that's where you go. You click subscribe, and when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it'll come directly to you. Um, I'm the one that's been a little behind this week getting uh, descriptions to Mr. Grizzly, so um, because it's been a really busy week, but I will get caught up on that, and uh, we will get the rest of the, this week shows up for the people listening on audio on audio cast. Um, also, if you would like to help us, you can go to our YouTube page. That would make us very happy. True North Eager Beaver on YouTube, where we are now, well, I would have to refresh, but as of when we started the show, 593 subscribers. Thank you so much. Uh, Kit Linda goes, if this doesn't send the subscribers over 600, I don't know what will. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, and all of them will be from New Brunswick. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We There's like 850, 860,000 people in New Brunswick, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, and speaking of New Brunswick, uh, Mr. Grizzly, I spoke to our friend there who we tried to bring on a, a good while ago. Oh, uh, okay, yes. But um, uh, had um, some issues that made it so that she could not at that time. Uh, it seems that those are resolved? not fully resolved, but okay. resolved enough that she can take us up on our offer. Excellent. So in about two weeks, Kits and Cubs will have somebody on the ground in New Brunswick who does have some uh, background uh, and knowledge with regards to politics who will be keeping their ear on the ground and uh, coming back to us and reporting regularly about what they see and providing some analysis for us uh, so that we can uh, focus some attention on New Brunswick. Um, we do have a name for her as well. Um, I guess I, without saying that, but we will have somebody, uh, we'll have Mr. B Mr. Beaver, Mr. Grizzly, and we will have High Tide Hilda. High Tide <laughs> Hilda. Okay, she'll be joining us, <laughs> reporting on things in New Brunswick. So, um, yeah, uh, like I said, we're, uh, we're trying, we can't be everywhere. And um, hopefully, eventually, as this grows, you know, we'll have someone in every province More and every territory yes. that will be able to, uh, you know, bring us uh, some ear to the ground stuff and who knows you know if we're still doing this 15 years ago maybe we'll have some people in like in cities to be, to be able to bring the municipal stuff to us and all that kind well i think things. dan dan could be a good guy for toronto right? oh yeah absolutely yeah 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 dan and i have been talking we've got some plans nice. <laughs> i should have known that already uh, hey i'm a networker yeah. what i do is communications that was my bag that's my jam as they say um so, yes, our YouTube page, like, share, subscribe. We have three buttons there for you to smash with. Please click them all if you can. That would be great. But if you only click two or one, we're good with that, too. Leave us some comments there, too. Hey, we like them very much. And if you would like to support us in other ways, we do have our coffee page that you can go to. That QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head is there. We saw that somebody scanned a QR code today. We don't know which one, but thank you so much for doing that. And, ooh, bomb threat yeah. at St. John's Airport, according to Kit Den. Yeah, I don't know what uh, that's Can you uh, look that up so we can leave some, we can uh, look at it, the, the Easter egg a bit? Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Um, so please uh, go to our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word, as did Kit Eve yesterday. Thank you so much. And Kit Eve had to say, we are retired and live in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Yes, people from the West, thank you so much. Thank you. We just wanted to let you know how inspiring your podcast is in giving Canadians hope that Canada will always be the Canada we all love. And this in all caps, every day you are a rainbow in someone else's cloud with a heart. Remember that, Aww. kids. Every day you are a rainbow in someone else's cloud. Uh, so they wanted us to, to know how much they appreciate our show. Thank you so much. 
and uh, kids, you're being very good to us, uh, Mr. Grizzly. And a fun fact, because we like to be transparent about how kids are donating, we have received more donations through our coffee page this month in the first 12 days of January mm -hmm. than we had received by the end of April. Oh, wow. Last year. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That, uh, that'll help pay for my new computer <laughs> to run the show. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, thank you, kids. Thank you. <laughs> you whew, overwhelming me. All right. Um, because democracy is something that you do. Share this episode. Think about how it is that you want to get more engaged in your community. If you're thinking about it, if you have the opportunity to run for something, do it. We need good people. We need good people. You might be the person you are waiting for. Like Susan said on her show, right? So she was always that person that got engaged and asked the questions and well, well, we need a school dance. Let's have a school dance. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, I tried chemistry, it was, but hey, this is my fit. This maybe this is your fit. So think about it, consider it. I said, whatever we can do to support that, we will. You know, you have us. Get your shots. XBB, flu, pneumoco pneumococcal. All of them, RSV, if you're uh, over uh, over 65, um, very important. Let's help to uh, do the neighborly thing and keep our hospitals unclogged. And uh, write those letters, especially if you're near Brunswick. Write those letters. Yeah, I've been just sending out today's show to every family member in New Brunswick I have on my socials. So, <laughs> Mr. Grizzly. Do you have some words of wisdom for us? Because I'm just yammering on here. Yeah, well, you, you know, you do that from time to time, and that's allowed. I do it from time to time too. There's no, there's no set structure for this. We we do what we do when we do it. And uh, you know, what do I have to say? Well, uh, it's refreshing, and helps my mental health to know that there are politicians in this country who are actively trying to make a difference to improve not just the community that they're in, but the communities all across their province so that everybody has equal opportunity. Everybody has a good start in life. Look, I admit, cishet white guy, physically fit, pretty good build for, you know, 55. I started the 100 meter race at the 50 meter mark. Doesn't mean I'm gonna be rich and wealthy. That's not what privilege is. So let's bring it so that everybody gets to start the race at the same place. This is what Madame Holt wishes to do. Create an environment, a community where everybody is equal, has equity, and has an opportunity to make the most of their lives and help the most vulnerable and marginalized members of our society get back on their feet. To quote Wab Canoe, we'll give you a hand up if you're willing to put in the work. That's what we got to do, folks. We got to help everybody out, help each other out. Life is short. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's do the best things we can as a community to pick each other up, prop each other up, and help everyone out. That's yeah. all I got to say. Yeah. All right. From the Eager Beaver Lodge, this is your Eager Beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourselves. Mr. Grizzly, please roll the credits on this one. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver media podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community and forum. And The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from fresh farm ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind.
All right, kids. Uh, three things in the ins Easter egg uh, because Kit Dan brought it to our attention. Uh, all, according to the CBC, all flight activity has been suspended at St. John's International Airport following a bomb threat. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary said a patrol unit is on scene as investigating the credibility of the threat, which came just before 8.30 a.m. Friday. Police are asking people to stay away from the terminal, which has been evacuated while the investigation is ongoing. Passengers are being asked to contact their airlines about potential flight disruptions. This is the second time the terminal has been closed to the public in a little over a month. The airport shut down briefly in early December due to a suspicious package, which turned out to be a false alarm. Lisa Bragg, a spokesperson for the airport authority, said the building was evacuated without panic and according to procedures. One flight appears to have been affected by the threat. A PAL flight from St. John's to Deer Lake was scheduled to depart at 840, but has yet to leave. So uh, that's going on. Um, a big congratulations to Canadian alpine skier Valérie yes. Grenier from St. Isidore, Ontario, who for the second year in a row, so she's defended her title, won the giant slalom in Kransia Kagora, I believe, or Kagora. Uh, I think it's in Slovenia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but barreled down the hill uh, giant slalom is two runs when you combine them she was in fourth after the first run and after the second run ended up first in all events she's competed in this year in giant slalom she has finished no worse than eighth so she is having a stellar season so way to go and the final thing i have which is something that i'll well bring us a little joy i'm sure um that? we're trying to talk about the orange menace less but this one i think is something that you will love according to the cbc barred from giving a formal closing argument donald trump seized an opportunity to speak in court at the conclusion of his new york civil trial on thursday unleashing a barrage of attacks during a six-minute diatribe before being cut off by the judge. <laughs> Quote, oh, we have a situation where I am an innocent man, the former U.S. president protested. I'm being persecuted by someone running for office, and I think you have to go outside the bounds. After a few minutes, Justice Arthur Engoron, who had earlier denied Trump permission to give a closing statement at the trial, cut him off and recessed for lunch. Trump, the leading contender for the Republican presidential nomination, has repeatedly disparaged Ed Garan, accusing him in the social media post on Wednesday night of working closely with the New York Attorney General to screw me. Trump, the leading contender, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, Engoron rejected an unusual plan by Trump to deliver his own closing remarks in the courtroom. In addition to summations from his legal team, after lawyers for the former president would not agree to the judge's demand that he stick to, quote, relevant matters. Well, if the lawyers are not even going to agree, why should the judge indulge? After two of Trump's lawyers delivered traditional mm -hmm. closing arguments on Thursday, one of them, Christopher Keis, asked the judge again whether Trump could speak. And Gron asked Trump whether he would be able to abide by the guidelines the judge had laid out earlier. Gee, the suspense is killing me, which included not trying <laughs> to introduce new evidence of making a campaign speech. Trump then launched into his remarks. This is a fraud on me. What happened here, sir, is a fraud on me. He later accused the judge of not listening to him. I know this is boring to you. And Goran warned Kais, control your client, like that can be done, and told Trump he had a minute left before adjourning for lunch. So it's basically like the Oscars, and they gave him a six-minute speech, and then they, they just like played him off. Sorry, lunch, your time's up. I gotta go. <laughs> well, I got something for you here. Oh, you'd love like to this. see it. I wish that would have been on TV. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of this, but you're gonna like this. I gotta. We we, we got to get in touch with Devin Devin again yes. soon. We should have him back on before this summer because this will be. Summer McIntosh cruises to 200 meter butterfly win at opening pro swim series stop. 17 year old generational talent clocks a time of two minutes, five seconds, is 0.73 in Knoxville, Tennessee. She is a generational athlete. Jeez. I mean, if 400s and are a specialty, I am in 400 free, but if she's like starting to kick it in the 200s, especially butterfly, ooh. Butterfly is the most difficult stroke uh -huh. of all. It's the most demanding, it's the most physically challenging. I'm that was my race damn. when I was a competitive. She's swimmer. 17. Yeah. 17. Yep. 
she, <laughs> the 17 year old from Toronto led from start to finish for a time of two minutes, five, seven, three seconds, nearly three seconds ahead of the second place finisher. <laughs> you, you realize destroying the competition, destroying a three second lead in a, in a, in a 200 race, meter race. That's incredible. That is incredible. Oh boy. Goes her way this summer in Paris and she just cleans up her and Maggie and Penny. I want the three of them to be standing atop that, that podium all summer long. Oh man. Yeah, all summer, summer long. long. All right. Kids and Cubs. Um, okay. I guess that's it. <laughs> that's, that's it for today. Yeah. Got to go. I got stuff to do. Uh, no, no pubcast this weekend. It is the following week. Yes. Um, my mistake. I have to go to the pub later and make arrangements because I had booked for this Saturday. So I'll, I'll change it. And I'm, I've reached out to the racks to find out if they're amenable to us coming down there and doing a show. Unfortunately, the, uh, weekend we were hoping to do Well, actually there's no matinees on Saturday in the month of February at the Rex, which might be a little bit easier for us to do something because we're not, you know, distracting from the band or whatever. But I'll see, see if we hear back from them. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll look at something else. Yep. It could be another month. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm. We'll just try and make something work when we can. Kid James, come on. Summer Long is my new porn name. Come on. <laughs> James. Oh. Damn it. Hard Yard, he said, was his new porn name. <laughs> that's a pretty good one, though. That's a pretty good one. I'm not going to lie. Hard Yard, that's a, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> Have a be perfect weekend, kids. <laughs> I'll Please. see you.